So we are here today with uh, Dalad Kambu. Uh, she's a Michelin star chef in Berlin. And we are going to be talking to her today about uh, what she's up to, uh, why she's in Berlin, and uh, what her thought process is on what's happening with COVID and what she sees as opportunities for the future. So thank you, Dalad, for joining us. Um, why don't you start with giving us an overview of who you are and what you do? So my name is Dalit. I'm a head chef at Kindi um, uh, restaurant. It's a Thai contemporary, contemporary Thai restaurant. And I um, sort of start using the term contemporary Thai because um, when I start cooking uh, food in Berlin, I decided that it was so wasteful to, you know, keep importing goods um, from uh, Thailand coming to Berlin. And I think it's time to, you know, uh, look into what we have locally and look into how the people want to eat um, and sort of adapt in that. I mean, in terms of flavor, you know, no Thai people ever come to um, to Kindi and complain. If anything, they are so thrilled and so happy to eat things that taste the way exactly they had when they were growing up. Um, but the presentations and the thoughtfulness of um, the thinking behind of being thoughtful of where we source the ingredients and how we run the kitchen, that is something that quite uh, different. And I, that's why we say it is a contemporary Thai food. And why Berlin? What, what made you end up here in Berlin? I was living in New York for about um, 10 years, you know, and uh, it was, um, I had a lot of fun back then when I was in New York. However, at some point, you know, I kind of got exhausted with the energy and how the city is so, you know, people just constantly seeking for something new and the materialism and the superficiality. And I had a chance to come visit in, to Berlin with my mentor, um, Rick Ritterawanit. Um, you know, he mentored a lot of Thai kids and I'm one of them. And I came to visit here and, you know, we start cooking and we met Stefan Lanria who owns Girl Royal and uh, from that, you know, it all happened. And I like that Berlin... I remember when I first got here, first time I got to Berlin, you know, that was, it was really hard to find meal that was satisfying. It was very, very difficult. Um, you know, there was only a few options in few places. And then, um, you know, now if you come to Berlin, there are colors, you know, they can't, for, the colors places for you to go and enjoy food. So the reality of it is, I mean, Asian food is kind of ubiquitous in Berlin. Um, Tell us what you thought of the landscape of Asia, and I'm clumping it all in together and you know why. <laughs> because that <laughs> yeah. restaurants clump them together, themselves together. Tell us what you thought about the landscape of uh, Asian and in that the infusion of Thai cuisine in Berlin when you arrived. You know, when you talk about like how Asian food being perceived outside of Asia in general is being looked down upon and being treated as a cheap fast food, like anything besides Japanese food, you know, is being looked at as a cheap, you know, Chinese, Thai and stuff. And they often, very, very often is sort of um, being presented and being made to fulfill uh, the customer's idea of that nation food, which usually either come from the very tacky movies or their time in 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 you know Pattaya beach two nights or in Phuket or in touristic area in each country you know like people go to China, to China and they went to this very touristic area and they have served this so they expect this is the authentic version same thing within Thailand and in India as well so um of course I guess each, each country would have different specific um uh, my um, uh, experience when you go but in general is being looked upon in that way and therefore the food you find in Berlin it just sort of when I first got to Berlin you know Asian food that you buy there for the majority of them it just doesn't do justice to eat foods you know and 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 the audience and the market want it to be low price and that's also keep them from making it better as well so you're sort of in the circle where it's like you know that people don't want to pay much of the money and the people who make the food don't want to do too much work then because it's not so much money paid. So it's, um, in my opinion, it was just, it's just kind of sad for me because I know that Asian foods are way more than that. You know, Chinese food are extremely delicious and have needs so much process. And then there are so many, you know, regions and, and culture like Thai food is like you go to the North to the South and East, they are completely different cuisine and, you know, but yet you go to every Thai restaurant in Berlin and they serve the same kind of food, you know, like coconut milk with fish sauce, sugar, and the curry paste already made. And, you know, and if there's some basil on top, then, then people think that's authentic. A lot of uh, immigrants, and that's not unique to Berlin, 
when they come to a city, they kind of adapt to the palates and the expectations of the city. So, I mean, can you blame a lot of the restaurants for the way or in which they were motivated to open and operate their restaurants? I don't, you know, I don't think I can, can blame the restaurant for himself. Um, you know, I mean, I, there are always room for improvement for everyone. We also do I. Um, I think if anything, it's more like because the audience look for that cheap meal. You know, if people want to pay five euros for a curry or four euros for five euros for the curry, you know, I've heard that how the price used to be. How can they use, how can they have, you know, make good curry pays out of that? And the portion in Germany in general is quite big, you know, and the traditionally it's been quite big. The bottom one feel full and it's not like, you know, but if you think about it, if you go to Thailand and there's somebody open French food, right? Immediately it will be high end. Immediately it will be well made. Immediately it will be served with nice wine and with good butter and all the thing. And it's just because the audience there and the perception of Western food is that it should be done nicely and high end. Now, last year you received a Michelin star for your cuisine. Um, so not just being the only woman in Berlin with a Michelin star, but also being one of the only Thai restaurants in Berlin with a Michelin star. Do you think that that's a segue to help elevate sort of the identity of what the sophistication of that cuisine could potentially be? Well, I, you know, that. so I live in New York for a long time and, and you know, when you go to New York, you know, like American Italian can get a Michelin star if they've done it properly and deliciously. A Chinese American can get Michelin star. Chinese food, like no one is sort of like, it's sort of like a, a thing that in the food called food world, like, you know, we sort of all like, yeah, of course, like we deserve it. It's time, you know, it's been happening. I just think here in Europe, it just take a little bit more time for some reasons, um, you know, and it probably has a lot to do with the uh, immigrations and so forth and or maybe the perception of people. Um, but I was really, really hoped that this year if there would be a more women and there would be more, um, you know, amazing cuisine that is not just same things or the majority it is, which is, you know, Western cuisine of um, foam food and truffle and all this sort of micro herbs. You know, I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I love them all. I like them all, but it just would have a bit nice to see something, but um, I didn't see much this year. Okay. One of the things I'm curious about, which is one of my favorite things in Berlin, uh, is Thai Park, Prussian Park, uh, where a community gathers every weekend to actually sell their wares. Um, it's generally home-based food or street food. Um, what I love the most about it, though, is the fact that it actually brings people out and brings awareness to sort of a different idea. What's your impression of Thai Park? Um, thai Park, you know, I'm not sure if you know of it, but it started out as, you know, Thai wife. Um, if for people who don't know, you know, in Germany, we have a, quite a lot of Thai women here came uh, by marriage to German's um, husbands. And um, Thai Park started out that a lot of these women, you know, they don't really speak the language. They new to the country. They don't really know the culture. A lot of them haven't met their husband more than once or twice. Um, and they unable to get job legally or um, because of the language barrier or that um, the husband would not like them to work too much, you know, because the husband would like for the tax reason, they would like the wife to not working too much or stay home or work, but you know, whatever. Um, so these women started to come to meet in Thai Park is in that area a lot. They live there and they start having meals together and people are walking past by and ask to like, oh, if they can buy some of your food can I try and that's how it all happened. It used to be a really small gathering, you know, and um, now it became so huge and, and thousands of people, I would say, some weekend, would you agree? Like thousands of people, like gathering, you know, and obviously it's no, not that kind of food, majority of it is not that kind of food anymore. It's mostly, you know, sometimes you see stuff and like, I never have seen this in my life in Thailand. <laughs> what is this, you know? And she's like, oh, it's okay, Farang, like it. Farang mean like foreigner, you know, foreigners, they like it. It's okay, just give, I'm like, <laughs> but in the way it's, it's a great way for them to earn money and, and to in the way if you have understand it's another topic of um, how Thai women who came by marriage not just Thai but I'm sure women as well and also Asian women um, by marriage this is the way of them to be financially independent but not for everyone of course because I still see you know sometimes some women uh, the husband is sitting in the back collecting all the money 
majority of the master is like actually quite sad. But also interesting fact is that there used to be like an old lady, uh, a few of them, an auntie who'd been in Germany for a long time. And she would come to the park and, and when it was small and she would give advice, hey, you can't let your husband do this. Okay, you have to do this. You have to go take class. Hey, you know, like if you um, stay here five years and you pass a language class, you can be here on your own. You don't have to worry. You can stay with your kids. If your husband not nice you, you don't have to depend on him, you know, and because, you know, all those women are scared that they have to be apart from their children if the husband leave them or something. Of course, those women are no longer there. So it used to be a support system for Thai women. Um, and now it's become sort of like a mechanic to earn money. The, the positivity that we can take out of that is the supportiveness of community and the necessity of it. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, which I know is a subject close to your heart, and it's this idea of authenticity. Um, and you touched on it when you talked about the evolution of even the cuisine that these women are presenting in Thai Park. I mean, isn't there also too, as cuisine evolves and people are trying to adapt to their local circumstances, the idea that what the evolution of that cuisine can be like Chinese American cuisine, um, that there's an authenticity in that too, and we should allow for that evolution. Absolutely, I think food is a part of you know, it's a part of the culture, it's like your language. The way we speak right now is not like how our grandparents or great grandparents used to speak. There are words disappear and new vocabulary coming up. And you know, a lot of people might say in some language people say that it's not great and we should preserve what we have. In some language people say that it's better, it's easier to understand and more way of explain. I don't know. It's not my place to say what is better or not. And so food is just like that. You know, it's it have to evolve, it have to change. However, you know, um I, I think for example, I love American Italian food when I was in New York. It's my something I don't tell people much, but I love those, you know, meatball. I love the raised sauce places and it's so delicious. But you know, they call it American Italian. They don't say I'm doing authentic Italian. I'm doing American Italian. And this is a story of immigrants. And we came here, you know, and we didn't have good tomato. We only have tomato cans. And we all stay in a small apartment and we all work in classes and we need a lot of carbs and a lot of big portions and to feed a lot, you know. And I think it's such a beautiful story and how food developed like that. Of course, many Italians be like, that's not Italian food. And they're right, it's not Italian Italian, it's American Italian. So same go with Chinese, um, American or like Thai. I mean, I think that right now we are way too early to have Berlin Thai food or Berlin Chinese <laughs> cuisine happening. But I think one thing that we can all agree is that there, that I think if you're gonna judge what is Thai food, if you're gonna really leave it just Thai, you know, it should be Thai people who decide for it if it's Thai or not. Agreed. Um, okay, let's touch on uh, the situation that we're now in and this, uh, this crisis and sort of how it's uh, blown the industry out by its knees. Um, you were running a relatively su successful restaurant. Again, uh, you received a Michelin star. You're well regarded in Berlin by your peers. Um, how did this crisis strike you and what was kind of your mindset around what would happen? By the time the lockdown started happening, it was very obvious that it's serious and it's going to take unforeseen time before we can reopen again. And um, so we very quickly uh, adapt our business to do takeout instead. And um, it's something that for me, you know, it's, it's quite easy to imagine that people would like to eat curry. It was still cold, you know, we want to get delicious homemade curry paste with, you know, our local sauce ingredients, the best chicken from Odafi, you know, from Lars and, and you know, amazing vegetables from the farm. And we just going to make those instead. Um, what was actually the problem was that, you know, when you have a fine dining, food, um, you know, 10 dishes of four courses menu, that is, you're gonna need 15 staff, you know, rotating, um, full time, part time, whatever. But when you do takeout, you only need three. And how do we create jobs for our employees? You know, how do we give jobs to our employees um, to make sure, and of course, at the same time, still make sure that we earn enough money to pay them all? Like, I personally, obviously, kind of stopped getting paid myself. Um, and just, you know, and, and give my jobs away to other people uh, as much as possible, you know, because it's quite simple food. And we've been open for three years. The Thai team have to be able to do the curry um, deliciously already. We know uh, how difficult it is to run restaurants. 
Um, and you know, just as you mentioned, um, and I don't know that a lot of people are aware, but there are broken things in every restaurant system globally in every city in the world. In your opinion, what has this sort of revealed about how we need to shift or change to build better business models around how we operate restaurants so that we can actually provide healthy environments for and, and good food for consumers? There are a lot of things that need to be changed. There, there, there are a lot of things that, you know, um, need to, to, to be adapted. For example, you know, when we talk about like people operating cash only and all those things, you know, if you talk to those small, small business owners and they will say, oh, I can't survive, I have to pay tax and blah, 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 you know. And in, but in reality is that I know for the fact that most Thai restaurants on country trust have they make more money than I do because it's cash, you know, like it, all the cook make more money than, than I, than, than, than a lot, um, a lot of people in my restaurant because they get cash at the end of the day and they just don't declare it. And, you know, it's, if anything we can learn from this is that the government actually can help you, but for, in order for the government to help you, you have to pay tax, you know, and we all just have to eat differently. And we all just have to, instead of you order, you go out to eat, you know, or order takeout every day, you can start cooking at home and your meal will significantly reduce the cost of it. You can go to Mac Illinois and you can go to farmer markets on the weekend. You can get great vegetables, you know, you can make pasta, you can grow some meat or source vegetables and it will save you a lot of money. There are many ways of doing that if you look and try, but a lot of people just don't. And a lot of people will say, I can order this for eight euros. Why should I spend, you know, 18 on your curry? 18 euros curry, it's from the best chicken farmer in Germany. The curry paste is made in-house, so it's like the way the Thai people would have done it. We pay our staff, not, min not like below minimum, you know, or like cash. We actually pay for their health care. We pay for their sick leave. We pay for their, um, for their retirement fund. Like, you know, those 10 euros different is a big difference. But of course, this is a very expensive, you know, the most expensive item we have on the menu. We also have something else that's like 14 euros as well, you know, tofu curry. And it's organic tofu from Kreuzberg, you know, and, and, and I understand, I do understand that in Berlin, people are very price sensitive. And that's why we decided, you know, we are 55 euros a menu and we were supposed to raise the price earlier this year. And I always push it later because I always feel like it's so nice to come out and I see people in the restaurant that I actually want to be friends with and I can talk to and they're nice. And now we decided, okay, we have to raise this to 65 euros because we can't survive with, you know, the new business model and stuff and the food cost has been gone up a lot. So that's what we're going to do. But, you know, 60, when every time I come up with a price, I make sure that most people that I know can afford to come eat them. Maybe not every week, maybe not every month, you know, but every couple of months they can come and have this nice experience if they want to. So one of the things that I've heard many times over in this time from uh, restaurateurs is the fact that consumers are gonna have to pay more. You know what a challenge that is in terms of trying to, uh, you know, put together the idea of what food costs and you are buying some of the best food and taking care to provide the best ingredients. Um, consumers, you know, you're competing against cheap Thai places, but also ch cheap German places. We're all competing against those. How are we going to convince consumers to pay more for their food, which is inevitably going to be the situation we're in post this crisis? There are people who do it in the way that like, you know, they're with the exclusivity and how amazing the food is and how special-ish things is, you know. I don't believe in elitism. I personally just don't like that and don't believe in that. So I believe in inclusiveness. So that's why the food price at Kindy always been accessible. And therefore, in this, people come to eat it. They experience by themselves. And perhaps, hopefully, throughout this, they will go home, think a little bit more, and they will spend better. I know that people, restaurateur always said that people have to spend more money on food. And trust me, I would love people to spend more money on food. And people should, should spend more money. I, for me personally, people should spend more money equally. Just because it's Thai food or Chinese food doesn't mean it has to be cheaper, you know. But at the same time, for a restaurant that they charge their place, it's like 200 euros, 300 euros bill per head or like, you know, anything above 100 euros. You have to ask yourself too that, you know, can people in Berlin ready to pay for that? You know, and, and it's a hard question because I also have a lot of friends who can't afford to pay for that. And they are great people, they're honest, and they work in the field and they have family, but their jobs just don't pay that much, but they are good people. And for them, it's like an anniversary gift for their wife or a 40th birthday to come to kindy. 
and that's make me so happy. But if I have a place that's hundred something euro, they they can't come, you know. And I think a lot of restaurateurs just have to think about that too. You know, one thing I always said, like you know, there are restaurants like that that doing amazing thing, and they go there, and I get so inspired. But I would never have that restaurant to be mine any second. I would never take it because I'm so proud that I'm, you know, I hire a woman who once was a dishwasher, and she cooks so well, and now she's my main Thai chef. I'm proud to hire like a woman who have, you know, a mental issue, and she couldn't really survive any other place because people are like, like making fun of her. Or I hire a woman, you know, transgender woman who got like bullied for being color, and I give them jobs and. I'm so proud to go out and to see that they are elevating. So I want to touch briefly because you keep mentioning your suppliers and your producers. You have a commitment to procuring from local suppliers, even though you're producing an Asian menu, a Thai menu. Um, why the strong commitment, and why do you think it's important? And what do you think it? How do you think it influences your clients? So for sure, I can't do Thai food without you know Thai basil or good finger Thai finger root or Thai chili like those things we still need to get it from Thailand. But the reason is that you know I love nature. I love to go to the oceans. I love to go to the beach. I, I find myself loving trees since I was very young age. And I know that the more we the more we fly and stuff, the more we killing those things. You know, it just we live in a time of the world that you know for so long it was a luxury to fly and lobster from canada or like um mango from thailand and then this out like thing from here and here and i'm not saying that we all should stop flying things in because um of course it's not possible but we should reduce it as much as we can and also how can things have been flown in like the vegetable been flown in for like 12 to 16 hours be as delicious as something that been picked and dropped to us four hours ago what are some of the positives that you've taken away and what are the things that you think we should hang on to and be inspired by for our future personal selves and also professional selves? I think, I think it's, that's really, really nice. Like for example, like Lauren's diet that they do like a little shop that they're selling produce and like, you know, sell the bread and stuff like that. And it reminded, reminded us like how much needed that type of place that we need, you know, a place that we can go in and we can trust that, that, Place. I mean, of course, we can go to math and all, but also, like, you know, there you get like lower sort of like specialty, like picking and all thing. And how nice it is to have those kind of places. And why was it that so long it was only math and all that we could go? Or unless you speak Germans and then you like been here for a long time and you have, you know, local sources to go, why can't it be more? And also, it's so nice to see all this restaurant doing simple food but delicious. And I, I personally think that just always been the future of the food, you know, thing that is, you can say it's honest, thing you can say it's unpretentious, you can say it's simple, whatever you want to call it, but I just, nice, so nice to eat food that is like, you know, you eat it and it's always oh, delicious. In your fantasy, what do you see as the future of food service in the food restaurant industry moving forward? Like, what do you think our role is in terms of feeding the public and the future of our industry? I would like to see the no more mass production of uh, vegetables and animals produce anymore. I would love that all those big farmhouse, uh, big corporate that they just, you know, basically destroying the earth and they just all disappear. I just wish we all eat local, we all eat seasonal. And I think it become a norm. It's not a trend anymore that it's farm to table restaurant, it's local produced restaurant. It should be a norm everywhere. And I would like to see um, people getting um, uh, same equal, um, opportunities, you know, and I would like to see more that um, it's not just every time there's a um, recognition from Michelin or World 50 Best and you look at the list and it's just all places that majority of people can't afford to go eat. And I would like that to um, really, really change. And, um, and I would like the consumer to be more educated and be more thoughtful of where they spend the money and how they spend it. That's beautiful. Delight, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank You're you. For welcome. Yeah. All right. I'm going to give you a big kiss. <laughs>